The Lord be with you. It's so good to see you here today, and it's so good to be in God's house. As we begin this time together and we try to prepare our minds for this next hour, I'd like to invite you to think about something. Control. Are you in control? Do you feel like you're in control? Do you feel like you have control of your life? You know, these questions and the answers they bring to us can help us as we prepare to hear what God might be saying to us this morning. So let us open our hearts and open our minds to whatever we may experience in this next time we have together. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. On our worst days, God is good. On our best days, God is good. When life is consistent, God is good. And when life turns on its head, God is good. Day and night, Monday through Sunday, God is good. God is here. God is love. Hold tight to that good news. Let us worship our God.
Please pray with me. In order for you to move in us, O Lord, we need to open the door. In some ways, that's the hardest step. We can be that mountain which seems impossible to move through our joys and our fears, our laughter as well as our tears. Move us this morning, God. The door is open. Welcome. In the name of the one who said, nothing is impossible, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Welcome to University Baptist Church. We're thrilled to have you with us. At UBC, we want you to know that God loves you. We love you, and we want to walk in faith with you. Everyone is welcome here. Also, a special welcome, and by the way, Susan forgot to put this in, but I'm going to remember. We'd like to welcome Vokes Leite this morning to our worship service, and we look forward to you leading us in worship later on. And you can remind Susan when she gets back, she forgot you. We wish her well on her vacation, whatever she's doing. Thank you, Susan. At UBC, we don't pass an offering plate, but would love to have you financially participate in our ministry. You can do so in several ways, by placing your offerings in the designated boxes at the back of the sanctuary, scanning the QR code on your pew card or also on your, in your bulletin to give online, or mailing your contribution to the church office. No gift is too small, and whether you feel you can give or not, we are glad you are here. To help us keep track of attendance, please take a moment to find the red attendance books conveniently placed along the aisles of your pew. Whether you're a regular member or a first time visitor, we kindly ask you to fill out your information. If you're new to UBC, adding your details will help us connect with you and learn more about you as you explore our community. Now, a few announcements. This Saturday at 5 p.m., we are hosting the Virginia Baptist Women's Choral Concert right here in the sanctuary. Under the direction of Susan Deal, she does a lot, doesn't she? The chorale will present a concert entitled, I Sing For I Cannot Be Silent, a program celebrating the power of music in our lives. Barbara Moore is accompanying the chorale, and Diane Mundell and Rachel Miller are singing in that concert. On Sunday, March 24th at 12 p.m., there will be an Easter egg hunt. We will meet in the fellowship hall after service for a pizza lunch and then egg hunt. Families will be given a map of locations throughout the church where they will find members of the congregation ready to distribute eggs. The hunt will wrap up in the sanctuary where participants will finish their search. The hunt is open to ages preschool through middle school. So if you feel like you're in that age group, you're welcome to come hunt for eggs. This year for Holy Week, we have something very special going on. Ken Miedemo will be our guest musician sharing his gift of music and storytelling with us on Spy Wednesday, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday. Each service begins at 7 p.m. And then on Easter Sunday morning, Ken will join us as we celebrate Christ's resurrection in our morning worship at 11. If you have not heard this musician, you need to be here. And if you have heard him, I know you will be here. Once again, welcome to University Baptist Church. We're delighted to have you here, and we look forward to sharing this spiritual journey together. Let's continue in worship. Good morning, friends. I just want to thank you for your prayers and support. We have accomplished so much this year. I want to share some of the highlights of this past year with you. I'm still involved in Winter Relief Ministry in partnership with First Baptist Corbin, emergency shelter is provided on the coldest nights for those experiencing homelessness. A hot meal is provided each night for anyone experiencing food insecurity. This project begins the Monday after Thanksgiving and ends around the middle of March. So to date, this season, meals have been served and 22 nights of shelter have been provided. I'm involved in all aspects of winter relief, but focus efforts on case management, stabilization, and counseling with participants. 
pop-up health clinics are still being held. We're still testing for COVID-19 and offering vaccines and booster shots. We continue offering flu shots as well as diabetes, blood pressure, and HIV checks. These clinics are in partnership with the local health department and are open to anyone in the community. Extreme Build is still uh, going strong in partnership with CBF Kentucky. A new home was built again last year. Uh, last year, the recipient was a single lady who had had a, a home fire. So um, this 11 day event includes volunteers from multiple states. My role is to assist with coordinating the event and I currently serve as the paint crew leader. Now keep in mind that that position is available. This event will be held again in June for anyone wishing to volunteer, come and serve with me in McCreary County. I'm still doing case management year round, helping folks look for jobs, apply for housing, eligible benefits, still doing financial education and advocacy to help individuals work on their credit and build their resources. I'm still providing a microloan program. This is really geared at helping folks get out of or avoid getting into a payday lending situation. I provide transportation and emotional support for individuals needing help getting to a doctor's appointment. This past year, I had several women who were suffering from cancer. And so I assisted them with transportation as well as emotional support. These are difficult times for anyone, but especially if you don't have a support system. Mental health counseling is a growing part of my ministry. I am still pursuing my licensure as a pastoral counselor, and I'm counseling under supervision with Cornerstone Counseling of Kentucky. So through this ministry, I serve with those struggling with addiction, survivors of domestic abuse, individuals and families struggling with grief, anxiety, and depression. I also hosted several mission teams this past year, and we were able to do some amazing work in the communities I serve. We cleaned up a park and amphitheater. We remodeled and painted a local partner that ha houses a hot meal ministry. And we helped with some plumbing issues in a home, as well as participating with Extreme Build. So throughout the year, there is always emergency food assistance, transportation, utility and rental assistance, disaster relief uh, during the flooding, as well as other ways that we can just bear witness to Jesus Christ and walk with families in, in crisis. There's always many photos and updates on my personal Facebook and ministry page, so feel free to check those out and send me a friend request. Once again, thank you from the bottom of my heart for your support. This work does not happen without you. I pray God's blessings on each of you. For, for anyone who doesn't know, University Baptist Church is a part of the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. And Scarlett Jasper, who you just heard describe her ministry, is a missionary. And oftentimes we associate missionary with something different than what she just described. But this is a part of who we are. So when you support either this church's ministry or directly want to support her work, um, this is what you're supporting. It's being what we describe as the hands and feet of Christ. And I, you know, I was just amazed listening to that list of all of the tangible ways that she's trying to make a difference in her community. Scarlett is a part of this initiative with the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship to help people in the poorest counties in the nation. So she is in one of the very most, uh, very poorest places in the country, in rural Kentucky, and you heard her describe all of the things she's doing. So our church is collecting money to help support that ministry, and if anyone would like to be a part of it, as Larry described during the welcome, there are boxes at the rear of the sanctuary. You can also scan a QR code, but no gift is too small, and you could hear from her description. This is making an impact in people's lives. Now, Peter, can you share with us? The Old Testament lesson this morning is from Psalm 107, verses 1 through 3, and then 17 through 22. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those he redeemed from trouble 
and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some were sick through their sinful ways and because of their iniquities endured affliction. They loathed any kind of food and they drew near the, to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind, and let them offer thanksgiving sacrifices and tell of his deeds with songs of joy. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. knows how to whistle. Anyone? I kind of do. You kind, kind of do? Of you kind of do. Do you want to try? No. Yeah. Who knows how to snap? Maybe snapping is easier. Snapping's pretty easy. Probably took a while to learn how to do. Some of you are still working I on it. I think it was this. I know. Yeah. It takes a while to figure it out. Anyone here is anyone here allowed to chew gum? Do you guys know how to blow bubbles? 
Yeah, that is very hard and you do need the right kind of gum. So there are all, um, you know, these are all things that are really hard to learn. And maybe it's not worth it or important to heart, or can't even read, maybe it's not worth it or important if it's hard, you know, maybe you just get the kind of gum where you can't blow bubbles. Maybe you do something else instead of snapping. Maybe it'd be easier to just put a song on if you can't whistle. Um, oh, I know, I I know something that's super hard. You have a cat at your house? What's super hard? Be, um, Usain Bolt in a race. That would be very hard, beating Usain Bolt in a race. I know if I practice a lot, I still would not be able to do it. But, you know, there are a lot of athletes, that's a good example, who um, practice it, a lot. It makes kitty cat, um, buy my stuffy kitty cat. You know, cats, you know, cats can be challenging. They do a lot of things that you shouldn't do. You know, keeping cats behaving, that's something hard to do. Like, do you guys have other examples at school Claire's or activities? Claire's kitty cat stick a little bead in her nose. The cat stuck a bead in her nose? Yeah. That, okay. So we're, we're talking but about... It, but it was at night. It was at night. You know... You went to the night doctor. I have stories like that from when I was he little too. Up, your little kitty cat snuck up to you in the night and stuck a bead in your nose. Yeah. Yeah. So parenting is a hard thing too. Yeah. <laughs> so we all have hard things that we have to do sometimes. But today's story was about Jesus and his friend Peter talking about really, really hard things. Um, Jesus said that he was going to die but be raised again. And death is a very, very hard thing to talk about. Um, it can make you sad. You know, sometimes maybe you can talk about pets or other things dying, and it can be a very, very hard topic. But Jesus told Peter that this very hard thing that Jesus was, was going to do is the exact thing that needed to happen for something better. God raising Jesus from the dead would proclaim to the whole world that nothing separates us from God, not even death. Jesus would take this hard and sad thing and point to the promises of God to be with us always and to love us always. You know, an example I read about this week is the cross. It's a very hard thing in, in Jesus' time because it represented death. But nowadays, you see them everywhere. You see them at church. People wear them as necklaces or bracelets. And we wear them or we see them to remind us that Jesus is with us in the very hard things and will never leave us. That's a really good reminder, right? God's love is there when things are easy and when things are hard, like cats at night sticking beads places they don't belong, learning to snap, learning to blow bubbles with the appropriate gum. But um, that is a promise from God, and so the cross tells us that promise. Jesus doesn't want us to keep that promise to ourselves, even when it might be hard or scary to share his God love. So one thing I want to remind you guys this week is sometimes it can be hard or scary, but we should always try to work on sharing our love with other people and sharing that God loves us. Okay, can we pray? Dear God, thank you so much for the lessons of the hard things and showing us your promise. And help us to remember to share your love with others. Amen.
Please pray with me. <clears throat> Creator of the universe, you made the world in beauty and restore all things in glory. We pray that wherever your image is disfigured by poverty, sickness, <clears throat> selfishness, and greed, the new creation may appear in justice, love, and peace. Open our hearts to your power moving around us, between us, and within us until your glory is revealed in our love of both friend and enemy. In communities transformed by justice and compassion and in the healing of all that is broken. We pray for the leaders of local, state, and national governments throughout the world. Give them the strength to lead with equity and justice in all they do. We pray for all those who struggle in silence, with challenges beyond their control. May they experience comfort and healing. We give thanks and pray for continued blessings of healing for Jack, Alba, Tony, Clara, Leon and Nancy, David and Linda, Jess, Larry and Lynn, Barbara, Barbara, Melvin and Mildred, Bob and Joyce, Jack and Ann. Receive these prayers, O God, and transform us through them that we may have eyes to see and hearts to understand not only what you do on our behalf, but what you call us to do. We ask these things in your most holy name and pray the prayer you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Gospel lesson today is from Matthew, chapter 16, verses 21 to 23. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Amen. Thank you, Vocha Slote. That was absolutely beautiful. Thank you, Mr. Cook, for your leadership. It has been an absolute privilege getting to know you all a little bit over the last few weeks. I've really enjoyed hearing some of your insights when we've had a chance to chat. And uh, since I leave before you sing, it was, it was great to get to hear you do why you get together every week. You got to sing. That's, that's awesome. Thank you so much. And I also want to say thank you, Susan. That was, uh, I, I didn't know that when you made the list of things that were hard that they were going to tee it up for you and uh, help you out with that list a little bit. You know, there's so many things in the world that are troubling and, and that are hard, so many difficult things. We actually talked about, just like Tay and I were talking last few weeks about some, some challenging stuff, and they came up with some great things, things about the future that are they're concerning, uh, economic concerns, materialism, greed, how to be able to really express yourself. They, they were sharing with me some of these things that came to their mind, and I was thinking about our conversation as I was thinking about this passage in Matthew 16 and Jesus talking with his disciples about some hard news. And, and now, right now, at this moment, there's so much in the world that could come to our mind when we think about difficult news, difficult things to, to wrestle with. Not only materialism and greed, but consumerism, racism, sexism, isolationism, or even the epidemic of feeling isolated. Xenophobia, homophobia, you know, how many phobias could we list? And to top it all off, we have, around the world, environmental concerns. When we talk about bad news, there's no end to the list. So, so we turn to scripture to find words of comfort, words of hope, words to push us along towards solutions. And instead of simplistic answers with little catchphrases, we find, we find Jesus. We find Jesus telling us about love telling us to love God, love our neighbors, to move forward in faith. And all of this can be hard. We use phrases like, be the hands and feet of Christ. And then we listen to Scarlett on the video tell about all of the ways that she and her ministry are trying to be the hands and feet. And I was listening to it as she talked and kind of feeling that sense of sinking back in my chair going, it's so much. There's so much need. And through it all, in the midst of everything, there is Christ, present, moving, and with us. Will you bow your heads with me? Merciful maker of all things, we come before you to worship your name, to lift our voices in praise, to confess the ways that we fall short of your divine glory, but also to seek your forgiveness and celebrate the wonder and speed with which you forgive. We come before you as a community, lifting one another up, naming those who need your help. We come before you giving encouraging words to those in our community, lifting each other up along the journey. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our gospel lesson which Ingrid read so well, begins with a shift. From that time on, and that phrase could be skipped over so easily, but when a, we read a phrase like that in the Gospel of Matthew, from that time on, we are about to see something significant. A cursory glance at the Bible allows us to miss the intricacy of ancient literature. Yet the text, the text right there is trying to tell us something, saying what's coming is significant. Pay attention here. Climbing inside the text, we can see that Jesus' followers were starting to see he was special. Here we are in Matthew 16, and we're at that point where he is not just another rabbi. He was, or maybe some of them thought, he, he could be the Messiah. Now, this is big news. 
For them, this would have been earth-shaking. Almost an inconceivable revelation. To appreciate that, we, we try to climb inside their shoes or sandals for a few minutes and walk along their path. If you were there, you would have heard this story your entire life. The elders and teachers would have all been saying, you could practically recite it back to them, someday the Messiah is coming. Well, you believe it, or, or maybe you, you want to believe it, but it's part of the landscape of your world. It's just something that hangs out there just beyond our grasp, just beyond our ability to see or imagine. There somewhere, the Messiah is coming. If we picture ourselves there in the first century, in that land, we live in an occupied territory. There is a foreign oppressor, the Romans, and we are a people of an ancient faith and follow Yahweh. And in this context, imagining ourselves in the disciples' sandals, part of our belief system includes it accepting and expecting this coming Messiah. We who have been living this our whole lives all know what this Messiah should be. The Messiah will come in pure, complete, and unsullied glory. Even though something is different about Jesus, he doesn't bring the trappings we pictured a Messiah would bring. There's no army. There's no triumphalism or great speeches of defeating the Romans. He, he doesn't even talk about God's power in vanquishing foes. No, he's, he's talking about love and loving our enemies. I mean, I mean, if we're being honest, when we listen to that sermon from Jesus, do we really resonate with loving our enemies? Our enemies are, I mean, they're our enemies. And he's different. He's radically different. He comes in humility. He includes people that we don't typically think of being included. Women, children. And he, he, he heals just about anyone, including people we think he probably shouldn't even be talking to in the first place. And he keeps going back to this message of love. He keeps going back to love. He's so different than what we imagine a Messiah should be. And for all of these reasons, Matthew emphasizes the shift in Jesus' message here in 1621. From that time on, his eyes were set to Jerusalem. What you think is going to happen isn't going to happen. Jesus wasn't ever planning to kick out the Romans. This was probably the biggest problem facing the disciples. If they had had someone ask them that question, what is the biggest problem? They'd say, I mean, it, it's obvious. The centurion right over there with the sword. That, that is our problem. And Jesus had no pro plans to address it the way they thought it should be addressed. Almost all of us look at a problem and come up with a solution, or at least at a minimum we brainstorm and think about possible solutions. Uh, for example, here in the city we have unhoused people. Uh, right around the church we have unhoused people. And so one solution could be the housing first model, which prioritizes access to housing without any restrictions, such as sobriety or minimum income requirements an evidence-based, low-barrier approach to homeless services, built on the belief that housing isn't something to be earned or something that somebody has to get, but something that every person has a right to. Problem, solution. Unhoused people, housing. What about global warming and climate change? We could, oh, quickly, our minds go to, could we massively uh, engage some sort of carbon sequestration or gr uh, green energy reduce the future of global warming. Problem, solution. Materialism, the one we talked about. We have solutions. We talked about some of those. Uh, ad adopting minimalism. I was trying to remember the things that we talked about. Uh, spending less time with materialistic people. That helps. Uh, practicing gratitude. I remember we talked about that and reducing how much media we consume. You see, problem, 
materialism, solution, find ways to address it. Our propensity to find solutions to problems knows no end. And the people who lived in first century Palestine were no different. They looked at their world, and they saw the Roman occupiers held up this situation in light of what they knew and came up with a solution. They surmised that the Messiah must be coming in a militaristic fashion to kick the oppressor out. This must be the solution. Problem, Romans. Solution, military king, Messiah. But Jesus had other plans. And he tried to tell the disciples about his plans, his way. God's way is different than your way. We say, for example, going back to the problems we can imagine, the problems that we see, the things that face us each day, we say things like people should get what they earn. But Jesus, back there in Matthew 5, 3, said, Blessed are the poor. All right, Jesus. We say people should earn their place to live. And Jesus actually talked about housing. Foxes have their dens. Birds have their nest. But the child of humanity has no place to rest his head. Matthew 8, 20. By this point in Matthew, the people who were listening to Jesus probably thought that he would be some sort of a military savior. Just as they thought he would kick out the Romans, just as they were getting to that realization, he said, y'all, hey, I just wanted to let you know I've got some plans. I'm going on to Jerusalem. And you know what? The religious leaders there are going to, they're going to hurt me. I'm going to suffer, and, and they may even kill me. But, and I think at that point they'd stopped listening. We do too sometimes. But on the third day, I will rise again. Peter interjected with the the common human tendency to find a solution to this problem. Hold on, Jesus, let's step over here for a minute. Let's take a beat. Um, You know, I'm not going to let anything happen to you. You know, we're not going to let anything happen to you. Peter, bless his darling little heart. They don't have that in the Koine Greek, but I believe that they probably imply it. He thought he knew the answer. We're not going to let anything happen to you, Lord. The biggest lies we tell are the lies we tell ourselves. Jesus had been dropping hints that God's way is different than ours, yet Peter couldn't or hadn't heard it yet. He was lying to himself. Instead of letting Jesus direct the conversation, instead of hanging with Jesus and saying, where are you going with this? Uh, You're talking about going to Jerusalem and, you know, like kind of nodding, okay, how is this ending? Peter pushed his own narrative into the story. Jesus, I got your back, man. Jesus, I'm going to protect you. God, I will be there for you. I asked a little while ago if anyone feels like they're in control. Are you in control of your own life? Are you in control of your day? Are you in control of what happens? I'm looking around to see if there are any uh, enthusiastic nods. Oh, yeah, I got this. And I'm not seeing any. Either you know where I'm going with it, or you actually don't feel like you're in control. We, We have control over how we act. We can control what we say. I don't know if your teachers have ever said that. You can't control what the other person says, but you can control how you react. In reality, the best we can do is respond through the lenses of our own experience. We can respond through everything that has happened to us up to that point, and we react to the world. We don't control the world. Peter did the same thing. He reacted through his own experience, through what he knew. Notice that Jesus didn't say he wanted to die. He didn't say he wanted to suffer. He didn't say he wanted to even go to Jerusalem. He said, I have to go. I must go. I have a divine appointment to keep. And this divine appointment was consistent with undermining misconceived human solutions 
This is a message to which Jesus continues to return from this point forward. He, can turn, he returned to it in the very next chapter. We begin chapter 17 with the transfiguration. And just after it, he says, don't tell anyone what just happened. Don't tell anyone until after the child of humanity has been raised. Later, he predicted his death in clearer terms, also in Matthew 17, and it really upset the disciples. No one wants to hear what they don't understand. No one wants to hear bad news. And none of us wants to hear anything that threatens our worldview. We like thinking we're in control. We like this sense, this false sense that we have the answers, that we know what's going to happen. Every single day, every one of us has is a gift. But that false notion of being in control makes us more comfortable confident. Now, Jesus didn't want his disciples to lose heart or feel bad, and if they had only kept listening past the coordinate conjunction, but they would have heard those words of comfort, on the third day I will rise from the dead. Peter and the others should have picked up what he was laying down because Jesus had already demonstrated his power over death. Earlier, In the Gospel of Matthew, a leader of the synagogue came to him in desperation. My my daughter, I mean, you know he's in desperation because he's now found this itinerant rabbi with the ragtag group of people following along. My daughter has died, but come and lay your hands on her and she will live. Jesus went with this leader. There was a little sidetrack along the way. He did another healing on the way to the religious leader's house. And when they got there, the funeral was getting started. They had a flautist tuning up. People were getting ready with all of their, the the paid weepers, uh, the paid wailers were there, tuning up, getting ready to cry and pour on the waterworks. Things were all set for the funeral. And Jesus is like, hang on, y'all. Send them away. Uh, She's not dead. And they all laughed. Then he went inside. He took the little girl by the hand and raised her from the dead. This this is the same Jesus who promised to rise again. This is a message of hope for a hope-needing world. He doesn't predict his death in a morose or pessimistic, pessimistic way. He predicts it because he can see that a world cannot believe in a Messiah who suffers for all and loves everyone. So what misconceptions do we bring with us today? What lies are we telling ourselves? Some problems in the world will probably have the exact solution we think it will. Housing for unhoused people, green energy for addressing climate change. These solutions can be God-inspired and effective. But today, as we look at our world and everything we face, both personally and globally. Think outside the box. Don't be confined to our conception of reality. When God leads us down an unfamiliar path, we have to fight the urge to turn to God and say, I don't think you know what you're talking about here, Lord. God is here. God is in this place. God is with each and every one of us, moving with us, walking alongside, beside us in whatever we face. Big problems, small problems, whatever we encounter, God is with us. And when we look at our problems, we do well to pause, listen, open our minds to solutions we've never before imagined, and trust that God is God and we are not. Amen.
as people who hear me often are aware, I, I really like saying God is here. Because God is, in fact, here. But God is also moving and speaking, and speaking to each and every one of us. The, the beauty of God's speech is that it's unique. It is tailored to you, wherever you are on your journey. And so as we come to this time, when we get an opportunity to respond to the voice of the divine, we can listen to what God is saying to us. And no matter where we are on our journey, we have something we can do to respond. We don't have to move. We don't have to go anywhere. It can be from your heart to the ear of God. But that response is to say something that is meaningful, that is deep, and that is honest. Whatever God is saying to you today, I invite you to respond. Now, some of you may be here and thinking that this would be a great place to make your church. We would love to welcome you into our family of faith. Some of you may want to make a profession of faith or even explore baptism. We would love to talk about that with you. Someone here may be sensing a call into ministry. We would love to join you in that sense of discernment. There's so many ways God could be speaking to you right now. It might be to go to someone who you need to reconcile with. It might be to make a pledge to study harder. Or it might be to say, give yourself more time. Listen to the voice of the divine and respond with whatever God is inviting you to say. We're going to sing together, open my eyes that I may see. Let's stand together as we respond to God. Now go in peace and walk in constant awareness of Christ just as Jesus walked on this earth in constant awareness of God in heaven. Amen.
Thank you so much for joining us for worship today. I pray that this has been a meaningful time for you, that you've been able to experience God, you've thought more about your faith, how you live, how your life reflects what you do. As you go from this time out into your day, I invite you to think about what you experienced during this time. Think about the, the hymns, the prayers, the scripture lessons. Think about all the parts of it. Pick one thing. Pick one thing that really spoke to you. Reflect on that this week. Think about it and try to see if there's a way that you can live and reflect that in the world. You are the light of the world. You are the salt. Be salty.